Welcome back. Today I have a special guest. Mr. Jason Wong started his brand Doe Lashes uh, with $500, 500 bucks in his pocket, turned that 500 bucks into a multi-million dollar e-commerce brand. Jason, welcome to the show. Good Thanks to have you. Me. Yeah, I think we've worked together. We worked together like three years ago. So this is a long time coming. I'm yeah, excited to have finally you. met you in person. Yeah. Um, all right. So today we're doing a format I like to call the problem solver, where where we talk about you and I just bring up maybe a couple things that we're working on solutions for, things that are rattling around in our brain, uh, problems we're trying to solve in our business. Could be our personal life. Yeah. Uh, and we pick the one that we think sounds the most exciting, and we run with that for the episode. If we have time, we go with more than one. If not, then we just go with that. Yeah, uh, I think the one that comes up a lot, if you don't mind me just throwing it out yeah, there. Yeah, go for it. Let's go. Uh, we can go personal we can, and then we can get into the business. But from a personal level, so many founders talk to me and say, hey, like, I don't really know how to balance. Yeah. And the truth is there, there's no balance. Yeah. But you need to find something that works for you. Yeah. Um, and the biggest challenge for founders is how do you balance work and relationship? How do you balance work and your personal health? Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years now. I started when I was 15. So in the span of 11 years, I've seen so many founder friends of mine go through that roller coaster. You know, they get into a business and then they start neglecting their health, neglecting their friendship. I just don't hear from them. Yeah. And the idea is that you have to give up everything just to just to run your own business. But I don't think that's true. There obviously has got to be a little bit of a sacrifice, yeah. but you don't have to give it up entirely. So I think that's one that I would love to double tap on. Yeah. Um, something that you see in your workspace from your teammates. Yeah, yeah. So definitely that's like huge is like uh, balance or burnout or like how do you like when something is so demanding mm -hmm. that you have to, when, when, when it's your shower thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're thinking about it in the shower, you're thinking about it when you're walking your dog, you're thinking about it when you, even when you're with your family, you're thinking about it. When something is that demanding and, and like requires that much to succeed, like how do you detach from it? I think that's an interesting one that I think everyone can relate to anyone who's been like that deep into something. Yeah. It could be a sport, right? Uh, one that I'm, the one that I'm wrestling with right now is maybe a little more business focused and it is at Triple Whale, I'm in charge of our professional services, which mm -hmm. is ironic. Uh, you know, as at the time we're recording this, Clavio just came out and announced their professional services team, and mm -hmm. uh, everybody's pissed at them about it. Yeah, uh, we we've had professional services for a while, and it's just coaching. You know, consulting. We get on on calls, weekly calls with e-commerce brands, uh, their growth teams, or sometimes it's a DIY founder doing the media buying, and we just coach them through it, right? And I'm having a hard time finding the product market fit. Like we have a handful of customers that have just sort of naturally come. Yeah. So I'd say we have validation. We have people who are willing to pay us, but we don't have that like product market fit where I can say, oh, this is the messaging and this is the market. This is the type of brand. And when we put that messaging in front of this type of brand, it like results in some sort of consistency. Right. So that's one that I'm kind of wrestling with right now. You and know, I'm it's tough, right? Cause like I, I have a portfolio of brands and there's not one strategy that will work for everyone. And yeah. every time I go on a podcast show and people ask me, how do you do this and how do you do that? One thing I always preface is like, what worked for me might not work for you. Yeah. And the biggest mistake that I made earlier on in my journey was trying to copy what the big brands were doing. I yeah. saw the big brands were doing these huge discounts. They do free shipping over X. I'm like, man, I have to do that. They start giving out discounts at the pop-up. I have to do that. Yeah. And I just don't realize that we're not in the same playing field. They have yeah. so much more millions to burn to acquire these customers because maybe they're VC backed, maybe they've been around for a while, maybe their incentive is X, Y, Z. Yeah. By trying to copy these people, it just doesn't work. So yeah. I think in a professional services, it's very hard to standardize because right. in apparel and beauty in home goods, whatever, it's all very, very different. Yeah. At the end of the day, you guys are at its core, a data company. Right. And there are certain KPIs that you optimize for. And the strategies to optimize for those KPIs will really differ depending on the company's cash positions. You right. know, how much can they put towards that? What's their payroll? What's their burn? What's their margin? Yeah. There will be a point where you can somewhat have a formula that will work for people, but you need a lot more input from these people in mm -hmm. order to give them the best strategy. Uh, most people that I've spoken to who have gone mentorship and consulting, they missed that mark because they're like, oh, my mentor said to do this. But I was like, did they ask you these questions? Yeah. And they're like, no. And I was like, if they don't, 
ask you these questions if they don't have these factors to play with how can they even give you advice to go they forward? don't have enough information to give you exactly advice. yeah this I, is right one of the things i feel like i run into all the time and why i uh at my core i kind of think like the agency model is a little bit fractured because we almost always in agency right so this is a done for you service we will provide xyz service for you in exchange for a fee um Oftentimes the fee structures have some kind of performance incentive. Mm -hmm. Right. So classic example in e-commerce and the example that I've been a part of and that you've interacted with is media buying agency, right? right. So an agency that manages your Facebook <laughs> and Google ads uh, charges $5,000 a month or 3,000, really any flat fee, 5,000, right. 3,000, 10,000, whatever. Uh, plus or or a percentage of your ad spend or a percentage of your revenue or something like that. And that's where it gets tricky is that it's like without knowing so many factors about your business, what your cash position is, uh, what your margins are, that kind of thing, they can say, oh, sweeping generalization, we can charge 10% of your ad spend. And that's just fine when it's like, that might be just fine for some brands and it might not really be just fine for some brands. And uh, ultimately I find that like, as much as it makes sense theoretically in practice, it almost never, it almost always ends up un, unaligned between the client and the agency. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I like the idea of coaching, like professional services. We don't do any of it for the client. Right. It's like very bespoke when we get into it and we are actually being like, okay, what are your margins? How much does this cost you to land? How much does it, sometimes we're talking to like beginner brands that like, don't know their numbers at all, but have figured out that some people want to buy their stuff. Uh, and they like really don't know. And I'm like, man, this is like where you can do the real work that helps people. Right. Uh, but then also sometimes you're talking to brands that are $10 million brands and you're talking to the VP of marketing and their media buyer and you're on this meeting. And that's why I think I'm having a hard time finding the product market fit for it. Like who's really benefiting from this. And, and like, are there really that many of those DIY founders that we could find and actually get on this service? You know, if we wanted to get a hundred, 150 people, because we charge like a very small amount yeah um if we wanted to get 100 150 people on this service so the, that's that's kind of what i'm problem here is most people don't know what they're optimizing for that's exactly right they don't know what where the goalpost is so the goalpost is constantly changing oh i need to bump my conversion rate from two to four okay great why yeah um okay if we do that we're gonna make a little bit more money but okay did you fix your bottom line did you fix the yeah. things that are burning more money and because the goalpost is always changing you can't really satisfy everyone because once you fix one another yeah. one appears i think the agency model doesn't really have the incentives aligned between brand and agency. So when I evaluate agencies now, I always look at what they ask. And if they're just saying, hey, here's, we could do this and this, here's our fee, and they don't ask anything else, that's a no-go for me. Yeah. And for an agency to really excel, in my opinion, they need to sort of be a part of your team. They need to know what they're working towards. They're not just working towards, you know, higher top line numbers. They're mm -hmm. working towards making sure that you can scale profitably. Yeah. Um, because Otherwise, agencies just get burned out three months later on. They're charging too much money. They're like, why am I paying you 25K if I'm losing more money? Right. I've done that. I've burned. I had this agency that was spending 250K a month for us, um, burning the cash. Yeah. And and they were aligning around the wrong metric. Absolutely wrong. And we tell so them they, they were looking at CPA or ROAS or some, something that didn't actually reflect the profit of your company. Right. And... and Here's the thing. The other argument is that like maybe agencies don't need to do all that, but yeah, everyone's different. There are agencies that are a little bit more easygoing where the KPIs are very clear. There's smaller brands that need to be a little bit more bespoke because they just have a lot more moving pieces and they need a little bit extra help. Yeah. They might not have a creative strategist. You might need to add that in from an yeah. agency. So depending on how much work that you're actually adding into the business and the incremental value that you're bringing, the fee needs to be accounting towards that. But most agencies, they just took a course, maybe they follow someone, maybe they work at another agency yep. and they just took that model and start servicing everyone. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. That's why everyone hates agencies. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here's, I want to unpack the product market fit thing for, for professional services. Uh, let's attack that. But, but I think actually we can tell the thing that you said onto that, because I think one of the things, and, and uh, maybe we'll get to it sort of at the end. One of the things that I find in doing coaching calls with e-commerce brands is that at the end of the day, the question that they haven't answered when they went in 
that I ultimately have to ask them. And I'm like, man, this is getting into being like a therapy session is like, what do you actually want out of this? Like, what do you want this thing to be? Is this supposed to be some big thing that takes all your time? Is it supposed to be this VC backed thing where you have investors or is it supposed to be like a lifestyle thing that makes you a bunch of money? Like they didn't think about that on the way in, you know what I mean? Oh no. And, and, and so I end up having to get to that place, but, but let me, let, let's, let's unpack this sort of, uh, offering that I have that I'm trying to get right and I can't seem to get right. So right now, this is what the product is. This is essentially what we offer. It's uh, coaching calls. Okay. And it could be either every other week for 30 minutes, uh, every week for 30 minutes or every week for an hour. And the price just goes, it's it's basically $250 an hour. So it could be $250 a month to $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And our, our starting hypothesis is that the people who it really helps are those like, like, you know, the, the people, and if you probably got this point with doe lashes at one point where you're like, oh, some people are buying this, but you had no idea what you were doing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you may be making 500K or 700K a year in, in revenue, which it sounds like a lot if somebody's not in e-commerce, but 700K in e-commerce Nothing. is a very small amount of revenue. That's maybe a, you know, 30 or 40K, 50K salary. It's for a full-time you. job. Yeah. Full-time job for a, you know, decent-ish yeah. Yeah. salary. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, they're making that much. They found some people want to buy their stuff, but they don't really know what they're doing. Right. And those are the people who initially were like, oh, those are the ones we can really help because it's like, we just, when you've been through the ringer with so many brands, as many times as I have, I'm like, oh, I can just help you like answer all the obvious questions. Like what is your actual blended MER need to be? And what is your like new customer acquisition need to look like? And, uh, stuff like that. So that was the original hypothesis. But I think where I'm running into issues is that I'm like, I am f- even as many brands as we have on triple well, I'm finding very few of those DIY founders these days, even in the, you know, low, you know, kind of low GMV or, you know, five. And, and I kind of tend to think that anyone who's not doing 500 K in revenue, uh, as cheap as our, as low prices are services, I shouldn't call it cheap, as low accessible as our services, if you're not doing maybe 300, 400K in revenue, you probably like, like there's I said, bigger fish is up fry. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's there, not a lot of that revenue triple trickles down. So really paying two fifty a thousand dollars a month for something that's, that's yeah. coaching might not be for you. You know, like, so, so I, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I've been a triple L customer. I think I was one of the first, I, I think at least first five customer of triple L. Yeah. Like a- Adrian sent me a product that was like half working. Yeah. Um, when, when I was here and I can tell you having so much data for most brands doesn't really make sense if we don't know how to understand it. That's what I think. Yeah. That's another. And, uh, and that's the problem. It's like, like we have a giant dashboard. We, we can see all these numbers, but most founders, there's really different types of founders. There's founders who are marketing geniuses and they, ha- you know, they, they know how to sell a product. There are product focused founders. And then there are people who have previous experience. They've done a few of these things and they can kind of just be at hybrid. Um, very little founders are people who are numbers people. Yeah. Um, and so they don't really know how to tie these numbers together and layer them to understand it better. So for example, uh, um, your AOV is great, but like we're not looking at what is your second time AOV and what's your third time AOV. Right. And we're not really understanding where's the product flow. Are they buying the same product? Or are they trying different products? Because that's a different type of consumer than someone who's buying the same product every single month. Yeah. We have all these numbers. We can kind of layer them and, and figure it out but most founders don't know that you can look for that and what does that do for them? Yeah. Because when you are able to find out those type of information, you can craft better marketing campaigns and segment them better. Yeah. Right now, most people are sending the same campaign to every single person, regardless of their persona and their buying behaviors. Yeah. Something that Triple Well offers is data, yeah. but they most likely will need your help to understand how do you use put this number into action. I I can tell you most people, including myself for the longest time, didn't know what to look for. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, most people look at these numbers and they're like, okay, great, here's a dashboard. Uh, here's how much we pay triple well, but I don't know what to do. So I'm just gonna churn a few months later because numbers are numbers. Yeah, what, do we, what do I do with all this? Right, so I think for your professional services, it's really just helping people understand what are the actual steps for their data. But for you to make that decision, you need to understand what is the goals that they're setting. So setting the setting the goal, are you trying to go for as many customers as possible because you know that your customer's LTV is X, that when you can get this, you can get a certain valuation for your company that you wanna exit. Maybe that's your end goal. Yeah. Um, or is it for subscription? Uh, maybe you wanna sell through 
particular products and you're noticing that these products are selling the first time but they're not, they're not selling the second time well what do you do maybe there's a formulation issue maybe there's a yeah. maybe there's a messaging issue but these issues don't really get brought up unless you deep dive into the into the data because for the most part we're just looking at it and it's like okay we sell something yeah. we make some money but we have no clue what to do with the numbers right and and it, you know what's interesting is i i often say that like <clears throat> a business can be a little like a magician right because you're looking over here mm -hmm. but something's happening over here right. you know what i mean so it's it's like uh a lot of times in the early stage, you're just looking at how am I acquiring customers? How am I getting new customers? How am I can, you know, finding new people and convincing them to buy my product? And uh, then you're finding some way to do that. And then when you find some way to do that, all you're focusing on is how do I do more of that? How do I make it better? When there could be some other whole other thing happening over here, like you're saying, like, okay, you find a lot of people who are buying your product, but your product, they run out of that in 30 days. How come they're not buying it again? Mm -hmm. Right. So something else is going on over here. The real trick's happening over here. Right. But they're focused on on like the big main thing that's in their brain. And and I think like you just summarized it really well is like uh, there are a lot of founders that don't like we're giving them all of this power, but they don't really know how to use. It. We're giving them this incredible tool and they know how to use maybe 10 percent of it. Yeah. And I agree with that. Can I ask you what what stage like if you were to try and define like what stage do you think they're typically in? Because I think there there reaches a point where once they have maybe some marketing team members in place, some in-house marketing team members yeah. in place, a lot of times those people either do know how to use it or even if they don't, they don't want to hear that they don't. Yeah. So then we're kind of, we get to this point where we're like, ah, look, we're not trying to like tell you, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I do think you think there's a stage like a, here? Like, yeah, un under like five people in a team, um, okay. it's pretty much gonna be the founder operations product person marketing and um content person yeah uh, under five people there's only probably gonna be one or two marketing person and one of the marketing persons gotta be social focused so there's only gotta be one marketing person that's data focused yeah, yeah. but they might not even be data focused they might be brand marketing right i've hired a brand marketing manager who you know is great at communicating our brand messaging getting pr getting influencers but man if you give them a spreadsheet they're like, what? Yeah. Um, I think the perfect place for you guys is brands that don't yet have a more senior executive marketing role. So maybe they have a marketing manager, marketing coordinator, um, head of marketing, even just head of marketing. I think it's somebody who's low. mainly caught up in execution on a day to day basis. Yeah. Because for you to understand how to string these data together to understand how to execute on it, it requires many, many years of experience to even know. Yeah. It, it, it's an aha moment of, oh crap, I can actually look at this data to do something else. I'll give you a really good example. Um, when I first started Dolab, Lashes, we were just selling four pairs of lashes, four different styles. Yeah. Longer, shorter, whatever. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Um, and then we launched another six styles. So we have 10 styles now. And we found that there's obviously a lot of great best sellers, you know, the 20% that makes up 80% of the revenue. Yeah. But then there are people who are buying the best sellers, but they're buying a couple others from the collection. We looked at our data and we see what are the product combinations that are the most common within our customer group uh, and and why. So some of them are new people who just wanna try everything, mm -hmm. right? And then we started taking that data and we built a curated bundle, a starter pack that people can just buy all these common things. Because typically when you buy lashes, in particular in beauty, there's a pattern, right? Maybe they wanna look very dramatic. Here's the five lashes that they'll buy. Right. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. there's something that they'll wear every single day. So it's probably not as dark, not as high volume, something that it, mm -hmm. wears, it looks like your natural lashes. Here's five that they pick. We took that and created two separate bundles for it. The subtle starter pack and the glam yeah. starter pack, um, $65 each. Our lashes are only fourteen fifty. If I don't have bundles, maybe they'll buy a pair or two pairs. Maybe they'll spend fourteen fifty. Maybe they'll spend thirty dollars. Yeah. By increasing the uh, by by introducing the bundle, we increase our AOV drastically because we know that mm -hmm. if we make it easier for people to buy, and we know that this is a common buying pattern, and they can just buy it all in one single click, we can get more people just commit to a bigger bundle instead of having to pick a little bit. Yeah. And we sell it as, hey, this is a great bundle, what we think you'll like based on the look that you're you're going for. And that that really changed our business because yep. it moved our AOV up so much that we actually had room for marketing. Whereas previously, dude, thirteen dollars, yeah. Facebook took took twenty six of that already. There, <laughs> there's no room for me, right? <laughs> And that's just an example of understanding data. Facebook right. took 13, 26 of your $13 you were making. Yeah, right? like I make, I actually pay people to buy my stuff. But that's just an example of like, when you have all this data, you could do nothing about it or you can see how do you 
make more from that. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't have the balance to do that. They're they're wearing a hundred different hats. Or right? like you said, a marketing coordinator, a lot of what they're doing is just like bringing it all together. Every Briefing day. campaigns, getting the content. Right. It's, so, it's a lot of action items, right. but not a lot of time to actually analyze. Right. So if there's a marketing team, if a company has a marketing team that has more than three people on a marketing team, they probably are at a place where they're looking at these numbers. Under that, they're way too busy. Okay. Coordinating campaigns, going after influencers, briefing, yeah. uh, photo shoots and whatnot. You need a little bit, I think like three or above, they're pretty okay. Yeah. A little bit bigger than that, they have a set. If I were to guess a revenue tier, I would guess probably about 5 million. That's when you start to maybe yeah. add that fourth person who, mm -hmm. and it depends on the AOV. Sometimes I've seen some brands get to 15, $20 million with, just a founder, but they have, they sell e-bikes or something yeah, like that. Yeah. They have a really high AOV. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think it's probably somewhere five to 10 million where you start to add that fourth person who's more of a senior level, has the experience, knows how to look at the data and has the time to look at the data. Exactly. And, and, and is setting strategy. And that's where we rub against people where, when we end up, uh, you know, setting telling you know coming in and, and people who have are the ones setting the strategy like feel through, like what are you gonna say you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh that's kind of where i think i'm having a hard time like positioning it you know what i mean yeah yeah so i, I need to find the brands that don't necessarily have that person setting strategy yet yes or or it's not a data-driven strategy it's like a lot of it's still gut optimizing and it's like have you seen this if someone came to me and be like hey you're on triple well you have all these numbers but have you seen that you can do this with that uh-huh oh beautiful it's almost like a good example of sapier uh -huh. i go on sapier and there's two million different types of configurations i can have many many different types of automations i can create two steps i can create 12 different steps yeah i'm way too overwhelmed to even know what to do right. with it but then Sapier came out, they don't really have a pro services, but they started creating these templates of like, did you know that you can do this if you stack eight of these automations together with this timer, with this trigger? I'm yeah. like, oh, great. You could do what? I didn't, yeah. I didn't know you could do that, but right. it's all things that I had already. Or and sometimes it's really practical stuff. Like, uh, you know, for a sales team, they might be like, did you know that you could just get a Slack notification every time you get a new lead? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and people are, oh, well, I'm in Slack all day. So yeah. great. Yeah. Like we couldn't, let's do that. Right. So you start thinking about use cases and, yeah. and you simplify to a, to a place where most people can just look at a use cases and say, oh, great. I have all this stuff from triple well. I just got plugged into this, crunch some numbers, and this is how I can infer the next step based on the data that I have. Okay. Uh, it's like in PostScript, um, there, there is a way for you to create a campaign from scratch, but they also have, oh, welcome series to promote a product, welcome series to promote a membership, and you just click it and they just build it out for you. Mm -hmm. It's all things I could have built on my own, but man, I'm way too overwhelmed to even know that I could do that. Yeah. And most founders don't have that bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah, if I can give them sort of a one-click uh, solution. So, so here's here's an issue I run into mm -hmm. pretty regularly when I'm talking to the type of brand that you're talking about. Right, they have less than three internal team members. Uh, oftentimes, they will have agencies they're working with, mm -hmm. and so they get on with me, and and maybe this just has to be maybe maybe we have to get better at like the discovery calls, figuring out like what is that aha moment we can give them mm -hmm. that is actionable to them because I think oftentimes they'll get on with us and we'll give them some aha moment where we'll be like oh yeah like look how you're doing this you know you could actually move some budget from this platform to this platform but it's actually an agency that's doing all that media buying so they're like yeah cool great I'll pass it along and then they're just not really compelled to continue to want to work with professional services and uh, that I think that's like another place I'm, I'm stumbling a lot you know what i'm saying that's the challenge of agencies is because it, they're not gonna throw you in a group chat with the agency right. and even if they do the agency's gonna be like well screw mm. off we don't yeah. want that yeah um i think it, it really comes down to a conversation with the founder and be like hey is this is this what you want and is this what your agency's giving you because i can tell you most of the time mm -hmm. our agencies are not thinking of those metrics for us yeah so you you're like it's kind of like courting someone at the bar. It's like, are they doing this for you? Are, are yeah. you getting that from them? So, I mean, this is the thing. It's like, okay, uh, a lot of times, dude, like I would say half the customers who use us ended up using us because they themselves independently were on, you know, she's unhappy with her man. Right? Yeah, yeah, she yeah. broke up with her man. And then, you know, you happen to be there, yeah. right? It, you weren't purposely there. You just kind of happen to be there. Right. Where we have to be really careful is like where, where Clavio is pissing 
people off right now is like we can't be like mr talking to you while you still have your man yeah you know what i mean exactly because we got a lot of these agencies are partners of ours and you know and, and you could say that maybe that is a conflict of interest for us and maybe you'd be right if you said that i don't know you know but but regardless it is what it is and we're not trying to step on agency toes and we're not trying to be like hey look man your agency isn't really doing you right here well you guys aren't replacing agencies you're you're right. supplementing we're not doing anything it. for them and the thing is it's also based on the founder and how much they give a crap about it like yeah. we had a marketing agency um, that we work with for our paid ads and i also have a lot of friends in the data space and we will chat we'll talk about these stuff and i have an aha moment because they're like hey have you looked at this here's how you can do it here i can segment this here's how you can send campaigns i'm not the one sending campaigns anymore but if i yeah. truly care about that and i know that my agency's not doing it i'll be like hey actually have you can you guys try this i'm yeah. not gonna say I'm not gonna expect you guys to always do it because agencies typically aren't thinking that deep for you. And I know yeah. that too. I don't expect that out of them. It's great if they do. Yeah. But if they don't, the least I can do is just say, hey, here's how to do it. Can it, you please execute it? It's almost like I need to figure out at the top mm -hmm. if they are working with an agency. Right. And then I need to tailor my conversation with them around like, let me just help you mm -hmm. like manage your, your agency. You know, I'm not here to tell you your agency's not doing a good job. Right. Once I find out you're working with an agency, I'm not going to go into your ad accounts and give you tactics they're not doing. I'm not going to do basically the other agency audit move where, yeah. you know, some other agency comes in and says, why aren't you doing this? Yeah, like, yeah. you should work with us instead. I'm yeah. not going to do that. I'm going to find out you as a founder or you as a marketing, you know, manager or whatever, you're working with agencies to do what? This, this, and this. Okay, great. Let's just like talk about the business a little bit. Like, give me an idea of your high level numbers. Oh, you don't know your high level numbers? Great. There's the aha moment we can have on this discovery call. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me about, you know, like when people buy from you, what do they rebuy or what, you know, what are your product paths? Oh, you don't know that? Great. That's the aha moment we can have here. Mm -hmm. And let me, through that journey, help you know how to just be a better client to your you're agency. You're empowering them with, yeah, you're, with the tools. You're, right. You're empowering, like, I need to focus on empowering them to work with their agencies better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, you're not going to piss off any agency because you're going to help them make even more money yeah and, and their incentive is to make more money right and, and i'm going to make their job easier it's like right. hey look you know right now the client's coming to you for a bunch of stuff that is out of scope because mm -hmm. they don't know who else to ask you're the only marketing expert they know right and uh so then you know you're having to dig up stuff about email when you're a pay media agency or whatever and uh you know I'm just going to help them realize that like you're probably doing a pretty good job right now and help them like be a better client to you right and exactly allow that's, you to do what you do best that's the right move yeah i love that thank you for working through that so here's here's where i think is is interesting is i think that a big part of this is the conversation man i had this conversation today so i'm talking to this brand and uh they're doing pretty well and i mean i think they're probably they think they probably did about a, a million and a half last year mm -hmm. and maybe year two right oh, that's great and right yep yeah, very really good profit you know probably running like a you know probably running like a 15 percent mer so they're only spending 15 cents out of every dollar on marketing right uh really profitable i don't know their cash flow situation obviously but like um you know, running really good gross profits. They've got a few team members, exact kind of thing you're talking about. It's like uh, one court, one internal team member and a couple freelancers, mm -hmm. um, classic stuff. And they like the, the founder, I think what I'm coming to with her is like the point of like, what do you want out of this? Because she's like, I want to double growth this year. She did a million and a half last year. She wants to do 3 million this year. She wants to keep the profit margins. And I'm like, okay, well that's aggressive, but that's okay. You know, like maybe that's realistic. Um, but like, what, like, what does that, what, what happens if we, in, where this comes up is what happens if we get into, instead of your net profit being 20%, right? So at the end of the day, you take home, you know, 20 cents out of every dollar you make. Uh, what if you halved that and it was 10%, but you doubled your business. So you took home the same amount of money and doubled your business and you did all this extra work. Would that be worth it to you? Is that what you would want? And she just like, hasn't even thought about that. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I think that was kind of where we started with your issue of burnout. And, um, I think we were talking before this and you're like, I got off social media. So I'm interested in what you think about this. Um, I think on the founder side, it's most founders just don't know what their goals are and their goals typically are tied to certain performance metrics. Um, you know, if I were to sell a company today, what would really make my company more valuable is three things, 
the the three T's, the team, traction, and tech. Um, what did you say? Team, team, traction, and tech? Yeah, three three things that will really bump up the valuation of it. Mm -hmm. um, for consumer brands, T is probably not part of the move, but um, one thing that I could say is if you guys have any proprietary uh, IPs, if you guys have any like apps that you guys own that have subscribers and then you yeah. guys have recurring revenue, that's great. Um, so that's a KPI to optimize for. And then for the team, if you were to grow 150 to 300, you don't necessarily need to double your team size, um, but you're gonna have to take on a lot more inventory risk to support yep. that type of growth. Are you ready for that? And you know, I think part of the reason they wanna double is because they've already taken on the inventory. Yeah. Classic. Classic growth stage move, right? Like yeah. place some big inventory buys. Yeah. Uh, and now they're like, well, now we got to sell it because we got to pay those invoices in 90 days, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's part of, I don't know that she's thinking about what's the big goal. She's thinking about, I got to pay this invoice in 90 days on mm -hmm. that 90 term that I bought all this soap on, you know what I mean? Right. So, uh, that, that's part of it. And I get that. And it's like, okay, sometimes we got to take care of the immediate problem. That's fine. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm asking these questions about like, well, what if you make less money, but you double? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you asked me that when I first started, I probably want to know too. Year, you year just two, said the same thing. Yeah, year two is it's still way too early. We're we're just babies. Right. You know, we're just figuring it out. I mean, if she's doing one fifty year two, that's really good. Yeah. Um, I haven't really seen that type of growth except for a handful of companies. She's yeah, she's doing one point five year two or year year three. I want to say yeah. But I get it. Like when you see when you get when you see the product and you see their marketing angle, you do kind of get it. Yeah. They may have a limited TAM. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. They have a niche that really likes their product, mm -hmm. and so they might have a limited total addressable market. But that niche, they really kind of got them. Right. Got it. Got yeah. it. Um, I think the next point that you want to shift gears into was the idea of burnout. And you know, before we started recording, I was talking to you about quitting everything. I quit Twitter. I quit newsletter. I quit a podcast. Yeah. Um, and I burned out and I started reflecting. I was like, why did I burn out? I think most people burn out because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel anymore. You know, when, when the things that you feel like you're working towards just isn't that exciting for you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that for social media in particular and a Twitter audience that I built, um, it was very fun for me at first. And then it just got really hectic there's a lot more people there's a lot more drama there's a lot like it just took out all the fun for it yeah and you know obviously there's a byproduct of building a business as a person with an audience but even then i gave all that up because it just wasn't fun for me anymore uh and so i got burned out and i started you know just went through a little journey of reflecting what did burnout really look like. like for you like oh you still want to get your, up what was your day yeah i just don't want to do it Little, yeah. I, I just feel exhausted, like mentally exhausted to the point where I don't even want to write. I don't want to write tweets. Um, I don't want to do any shows. I haven't done podcasts in many, many months. Good. Yeah. I feel honored. I got you. I got yeah, you. I'm I coming back. I'm coming back. Uh, yeah, get a little bit of a comeback, but in a reasonable pace. Coming back at, at a place where I feel very happy because I'm actually working on a business now that I'm very passionate about. Yeah. Um, two years ago, I started a packaging business called Packing Duck, uh, where we manufacture packaging for DDC brands. It oh. was a space that I felt like no one was. Within. Manufacture, say it one more time. Manufacturing okay. uh, DDC yeah. brands, uh, the packaging for us. So the secondary, the shipper boxes, anything that you see from a DDC, right. thing that protects a product, we right. make it. Yeah, the thing that you open, when you get the product, mm -hmm. you open a box. And the that, thing that stores it too. Yeah, anything anything that like you're opening to get to the product. And I love it, man. I, I realized that I love working with different brands, strategizing on like what is the perfect unboxing experience, because my background is in e-commerce, I understand the things that most manufacturers don't. Like yeah. the experiences like um, shipping weight, da 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 da. Uh, and so we've had a lot of fun for it, but I haven't tweeted about it at all. No one on Twitter really knows about it, except for some people that are referring us. Yeah, I I, uh, I had to dig down the rabbit hole a little bit before we did this podcast <laughs> that you realize you even had it. Um, and for a while, I know you were like doing some consulting as well. I want to back up and, and talk about burnout a little bit because... Uh, I think your story is actually really similar to a lot of people who are just achievers in general. And like, what was your early, what was like early childhood like for you? Like what was your like mm -hmm. elementary school, middle school? Yeah. Uh, long story short, cause I moved around a lot. I came here from Hong Kong when I was eight, we moved to New York Chinatown. It's just my mom and I, you know, mm -hmm. um, parents divorced and we didn't really have a place to stay. So we just live with relatives. And the one thing about immigrants is that we typically take over an entire industry. So my yeah, family- I heard a story yeah, about this the other day. Right, yeah. like Koreans take over laundry mats or convenience stores. Um, um, who's uh, manicures is- Yeah, uh, yeah. Vietnamese people. So we yep. take over the whole industry. So yep. my family was Chinese takeout restaurants. Okay. And so since I was eight up to the point I was an adult, I was working in restaurants. I, I've worked in every single role 
Then the cashier, as soon as I can speak English, I was a cashier. Then as soon as I was tall enough to cook, I was cooking, chopping stuff out. So I grew up with a childhood where I was just constantly surrounded by my family that were hustling, hustling. Uh, you know, to become an American, to fit in with the culture and, you know, to build the American dream. And that was what I grew up with. Um, it was a hustle culture. You're, uh, is English your second language? Yeah. 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 I, I think there's a lot of that. And, and like, I mean, I notice this with immigrants a lot. It's just like uh, immigrants first generation or like their parents are immigrants. Yeah. It's like, uh, they're, they're some of the best people to hire some of the, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're very driven, but yeah, there's this hustle culture to it and maybe never a question of like, but why? Right. You know? I, I think we're just always in survival mode. Right. Like, yeah. As soon as I land it in America. You don't ask why when you just got to eat, you know? Yeah. There, there's no backing out for it. There's no safety net. You know, yeah. I, I think the reason why I want to start dough with $500, even though I had way more than that um, at that point was to show people what you can make with very little. So did you start dough when you were 15? No, I started dough when I was in my twenties. Okay. Mean, uh, 21. So yeah. you said you started doing this when you were 15. So you were working in Chinese Restaurant. restaurants yeah you're um, uh you're 15 years old so you're probably cooking at this point yeah and then um 16 years old i moved to toronto with my mom mm -hmm. uh and a friend of mine got me into uh blogging so there was this platform back then called tumblr oh yeah um so he was like dude you gotta go on these tumblr blogs just make content get some traffic get people to share and he he brings me into these facebook groups and so it's a facebook group of a bunch of like teenagers like 12 year old, 15 year old, and there were even like the 20 year olds. And what, we're just- What year was this, by the way? This is 2013. This is like the heyday of Facebook groups. Yeah. yeah. So all of us, like hundreds of, we're just sharing each other's posts, right? We're uh -huh. just like, sh I have I have a thousand followers. You have a thousand followers. I'll tweet once, uh, reblock once, you reblock once. Mm -hmm. And then my friend was like, hey, log in and sign up for AdSense. And back then you can get people to like click your ads for you. Yeah. So we're like, okay, great. Everyone let's just share each other's posts, <laughs> get a lot of traffic yeah, there. Yeah, this little click farm going on AdSense. Huh? Yeah, and I, I mean, I was I was a kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't know that you're not supposed to do that. You're just like, I don't know, they pay I mean, me if, for it. If Google watches this right now, I'm just, I just wanna apologize. None, none Please this, don't. <laughs> none of this actually happened. This is all for entertainment purposes. <laughs> um, but eventually I, I learned that um, just want to apologize. <laughs> brands wanted to get more traffic. Yeah. Um, and so they were media buying on blogs. Yeah. And so they were paying us like a hundred bucks to post about them. I was like, mm -hmm. great. That's awesome. Like we get money from this. Yeah. Um, and one of my earliest clients was Shein. 2014. Okay. This is when they first came to America. Yeah. I, I still have emails of how much they pay me. They were paying me like three cents CPM. It was insane <laughs> how low they pay me. But that, that was money. That was good that's, money that's for me. That's what you make from from Twitter ads. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, eventually I learned that when a lot of these other kids have these massive blogs of 20, 50, some of them have a million followers. They don't really understand the monetary value of their asset. I call them an asset now. Right. They were just tweeting and blogging for fun. Yeah but I know how much money they can make. So I started taking all my earnings and I start buying out their their blogs oh. and I start building so a network. you're starting to create a little empire of these. Yeah, and by the end of my time, I had about 32 million followers mm -hmm. um, and I was working with brands like Coca-Cola. And are these mostly like meme type blogs or like what, memes, yeah, what, photography, what's the content? A lot of yeah. memes. And I mean, there was a time when most of the stuff that you see on Instagram were from Tumblr, but now they're from Twitter. Yeah. But there was a time when we were the creators of these memes yeah and that people will repost them to him. so i found the business of reselling basically media spaces yeah to these major companies and i start charging them more money not three cents cpm anymore i charge them a thousand dollars two thousand dollars for these things and did you have to do like outbound to get the or were they all like reaching out to you a lot of outbounds this is before you had Dude, to you like built a legit media business yeah you're doing outbound sales yeah i was like kid. ad I just, space i just emailing them. blogs hello yeah. i have a blog with x amount of followers yeah. hello my name is jason uh, yeah. yeah and you know it doesn't cost me anything to post. So sometimes I'll just post, get them a bunch of views and then say, Hey, I've made this post for you guys. And they're like, Holy crap. Yeah. Uh, how do we work with you on an ongoing? This game? is yeah. before the FTC said you had to put a hashtag sponsor. Yeah. That's how early we were. We, we were just figuring things out. Yeah. But anyways, the story goes into that. After I started making these brand deals, I realized that, Hey, if I'm making them that much money for them to keep paying me, why don't I just make my own brand? So I started my first e-commerce business called Trendico. It was a clothing company. And the idea is I would take trending graphics and internet moments and putting them onto a t-shirt. Uh -huh. The thing that really popped off for us was, you know, remember like the Drake's hotline blank video, the music video where he was dancing. Yeah. I, put that into a sweater and it just blew up, went on like every publications, went on Buzzfeed, just 
I was like, holy crap, that's a lot of money. And um, people bought it and you, I, I, you're I, just I, using Teespring or something like that to print it? Or? No, I didn't even know Teespring existed. You're printing it at because, some local print shop? No, because I'm Chinese. I went to my Chinese contacts <laughs> and I, 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 like I got a guy. I got them printed. <laughs> And I got them stock. I didn't even know what drop shipping is. I okay. I didn't even know. Oh, so you like bought inventory? Yeah, I legitimately Dude. didn't know you could do print on demand. I didn't know you could do drop shipping. I was buying inventory. You, the the businesses you were making when you were in your teens are like legit businesses. I just didn't know. I was just you figuring didn't know it out. How legit the thing was. is, yeah. most founders were just figuring shit out, right? Yeah. So I uh, I posted on to my Tumblr blog. I basically have zero dollar marketing costs. Yeah. Posted within my network, made a hundred k in a week. I was like, holy crap, that's what I would have made in a year if I got a job. Yeah. And that really snowballed into the next thing. So like when the presidential election came in in 2016, I made shirts of like, like funny shirts of all the presidential candidates. Yeah. Cause yeah. that was all the hype. They will buy anything for the supporters. And it's not just like a boring shirt that they are selling on their shop. I'm Photoshopping laser beams out of Bernie Sanders eyes, you know, right. like yeah, you're, you're, funny shit. It's gotta be parody for it to be legal. So right. you're, you know, already even. And that was my first business. And then the second business I started so, was- what, what happened um, with that business? Hold on. Like we get, and just move on until you do I, I you sell it or I didn't even know you could sell businesses <laughs> you just it's just gone now um there's and and then eventually my my tumblr blog got banned oh, okay. um Tum tumblr got acquired by yahoo they were really strict on third-party advertising oh, okay. so anyone that was advertising that wasn't them <laughs> just got cut so I, oh, I lost everything and gotcha. and so there was no point for were you already moved on to another business at this point or? way way later um, yeah. actually not way later a year later okay. so after that business i just closed down it's so whatever i was making sure I, did, I don't like having sweaters next to my bed I was fulfilling out of my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't know about Teespring. So. Yeah, I literally packed every order, printed a shipping label, drove to USPS. I have a picture I'll show you later <laughs> yeah. of my car, just packages. Um, but the next business You're I started- like sticking labels on them yourself? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and so like, now now I have a logistics business, you know, which is funny. But like three episodes, I had like employee number like eight from Teespring on the show. <laughs> oh, you would have like loved to know you back in 2013, 2014. I would have brought them some good volume. But yeah. no, I-, I you know, just grind it yeah. uh, for it. But then, okay. So, so you, yeah, you moved on from that and eventually the, the, that, that opportunity fizzled out anyway. Yeah. The next business was really like, I think what put me on the map. Um, I started a company called meme Bible, which is a coloring book of the year, the year's most popular meme. So the way I think about it is like a yearbook of all the memes that happened in that year. So mm -hmm. like crossword puzzles, hangman, color in the stuff. We even had a a portion where you can cut and make an origami okay. of stuff. And that that's thing, actually a pretty cool product. I oh, think. it's a great product. Yeah. But here's the story. I, I had a, my Tumblr block still, but I didn't have the product. I just had the design. So I hired someone on Upwork to design it and I got him to render it as a book. So there's a picture of the book. It looks legitimate. Mm -hmm. It looks like a book. It looks like you can flip through it, but I never had the book. Okay. Put it on the site. Uh, made a meme about it, and I, I basically made a meme that looks like people are talking about this Christmas present that they're getting, mm -hmm. uh, like an early Christmas present, because this was December 3rd when I launched. Um, and it was a meme coloring book, and just flipping through it, it blew up, got 120,000 reblogs, which is millions of views. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did, I think, 100K within the first few days. Okay. And I well, didn't have the book. And you didn't have it. I didn't have a single book on me. Did you know that that was a possibility that you would do that no or it was that, literally that a was joke. outside the room it was a of pure you. joke okay. i even have an lc setup it was literally a joke of like oh maybe we'll make a so call you're book. like okay how do i get all these books printed Dude, i was selling those books for nine dollars <laughs> <laughs> and and like so like, now you got to get like ten thousand books printed basically yeah so december 3rd usps cutoff time is december 13 or 14. yeah um i went to a local print shop i was like hey listen i have a huge favor for you i'm not getting this shit from china i have to get it here yeah i printed everything i packed it out of my room uh by the end of that week i made a quarter million dollars um and i and that was the beginning of the meme company so i yeah. launched four more years of that coloring book how much did it end up costing you to get it like all printed that quick and stuff like that <sighs> i think like 90 cents the first iteration was 90 cents because it was very small. So you made a quarter million dollars. You probably only spent like 25,000. Yeah. And a bunch of your time. Yeah. I mean, Uncle Sam took a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Uncle Sam will take the cut. But, yeah. Um, uh, and, and you also probably slept like two hours a day during that period. But. Yeah. But that like up the ceiling for me because before then the most money I made was like, oh, great. A drop makes 100K. But this one made a quarter million a week. So I was like, oh, wait, you can make a lot more money with different products, it's just things just start unlocking for me. Cause I didn't go yeah. to business school. I was studying to be a doctor. I will be a terrible doctor. Thankfully I'm not a doctor, yeah. 
but I just wasn't thinking about these things. Is that like a culture thing? Like, is that like a common, like, oh, you gotta be at like school and- No, no, it's, it goes it back to you. the survival thing. It's like, you come back, you come to this country and you're just thinking, how do I make the best out of it? Mm -hmm. And so you're either gonna be a professional service, legal, lawyer, doctor, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. uh, or like a high paying tech job. There's really no other option. Like your parents didn't move you to this country for you to work at a job lower than a hundred K. Yeah. And so what I did was Google highest paying job and like the top five was doctor. like surgeon, plastic surgeon, yada, yada, yada. Like, I gotta be one of them then. And I wasn't even passionate about medicine. So one day I woke up, um, I think I was going, I was going to do a Reddit of like, AMA asked me anything, I'm a doctor and everyone was just miserable because they said they did it for the money. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I am one of those guys. I did it for money. I want to get paid for it. So I said, you know what, screw this. I'm just got full send my marketing thing, my social media thing, the e-commerce yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, but you yeah, didn't that, even know what to call it. Then you're like this thing where I do memes and I make money from it. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That kickstarted everything. Yeah. And so then meme Bible, did that like go on? Uh, yeah. It went yeah. on for four years. We launched a board game called meme bands where it's like heads up. There's a band around it. There's a car. People will reenact it and you have to guess it. Yeah. Um, we had a bath bomb company. We had a candle company like meme meme sense like funny sense <laughs> one of the sense i love was like the scent of you crying yourself to sleep and it was just like a laundry um you know like a laundry scent yeah, yeah, yeah. um so we built an entire company out of it which is me and another partner that i brought in from school um and and then i sold that business okay so that's when i realized so that that when, when you sold something you realize like oh yeah you can this yeah. is an asset yeah okay but dude like no one teaches you things these things like when i started selling stuff online there's no courses there's no youtube <laughs> there's yeah. nothing you just have to figure shit out right um, yeah. and, and then with that money that you sold it with, that's what you created dough with. Uh, you know, that gave me a little bit of a cushion uh -huh. to figure out my next but, step. Well, I guess you only created dough with $500. So at this point you've got money. Mm -hmm. Why only use $500 to create dough lashes? It was to prove a concept that you could start from zero. Um, nice. so with $500, I spent 420 or 440 on inventory. Okay. And the rest, 29 bucks to Shopify for the plan. Uh, Did you like do this on YouTube or something like that? Or you're like, no, it's just to prove it to myself. Just to prove, I, I didn't even document it. <laughs> I mean, that would be <laughs> I just wanted to see if I could do this it. This is it, you're documenting it now. So you spent 440 on, on inventory. Yeah, each pair of lashes was $2 at the time because we only bought 50 units of each style. So four, 200 pairs uh -huh. of lashes, two bucks each, plus a little bit of shipping. I sent a hundred of that to influencers. I was just DMing influencers, hey, can I send you some lashes? This is 2018. So like there wasn't a lot of brand sponsoring influencers at that point. Yeah. Brands were kind of glossing over the micro influencers. They were going for like the the big, big guys, the yeah, Kim K's the of the car. world. Yeah. So we went under we went after people that are under ten thousand followers, sometimes even under five thousand. Wow. Well, okay. And I think what really helped us is I think for business a lot of times timing. That was when TikTok came in. Yeah. When TikTok came in, brands kind of disregarded it as a, just a dancing app for teenagers. And so I went on to TikTok and I was like, wait, there's something about TikTok that is completely different than other social media that I've been on. Because I've been on Tumblr, I've been on Instagram, yeah. I've been on yada, yada, yada. This is completely different because for the first time, your post is not only shown to your followers, but to people that they think is interested. So you could have zero followers and get a thousand views. That's never happened in the history of social media for us. Mm -hmm. And so I went on these TikTok accounts. I, I found someone with 500 followers, but they're get, making really good videos. I said, can I send you lashes? They have never gotten sponsored packages before because they only have 500 followers. Right. So I went after the people who never got discovered and I send them lashes. They make videos, they're raving about it. They're giving us all their attention. And all they have to do is like, you don't have to pay them. You're just sending them a $2. Yeah. And what's it cost to ship it? 20 cents, something like that, you know? Like 370. <laughs> okay. Uh, for USPS, but like, okay. but all in all, we went after the guys that people weren't sponsoring and yeah. those end up being our loudest voices. And now they have- Yeah, they make great content about it, but then you're also trying to spot people who are like mm -hmm. up and comers. Up and, yeah, so I'm very proud of a lot of people that we work with who I discover at a thousand followers who are still friends with me today. They now have a million, some of them have 60, some you know just aren't a creator anymore, but they made good money and they, they had good traction from it. But yeah. that's what we went, we went for the small guys and that's yeah. how Doe blew up on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, and Doe became the lash brand of TikTok. Yeah, we I think we're the it, fastest growing brand on TikTok uh, at one point. Right. Well, I I think you guys really hit TikTok when a lot of brands weren't. Yeah. 
you know? And I started tweeting about it and that's how I built my Twitter audience. I, it was never meant to be a business. I literally was just documenting, oh, here's how I did this. Yeah. Even even the cart uh, bundle idea that I told you, I documented how I found the products that people were buying and how I made a bundle about it. I documented the whole process. Yeah. Um, purely to remind myself um, on how to do it later on. Yeah. Usually I'm, I'm pretty forgetful, but like, by documenting and building in public, I got a lot of good feedback from other founders. So like, have you thought about this? Yeah. Did you do this? Let me connect you with this person and you do that. Right. And that helped us a lot. Yeah, yeah. And then you bring paid media into it. And that's, I think, when I when we met you. But it was shortly after you guys were on, like, it was like 2019, I think, when we were working. Yeah, we didn't run ads for the first year of our company. Yeah. It was purely through organic influencer seeding. Yeah. And I, so, so, okay. The point was to prove a point that you could yeah. start from zero. Can you still do that today? I think not so. the exact same way, obviously, but um, with TikTok organic, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Um, we I have a client now, so now my business we do sourcing, logistics, and uh, fulfillment. And one mm -hmm. of my clients came to me. He's 19 years old. Watch a YouTube video on how to do drop shipping. Found a really good product and just make organic content every single day. Once a day, post a video on it. When he met me, he was doing 20k a month. I was. And then, I mean, that's pretty good. It's great for someone who's 19, just watch a YouTube video. Um, we onboard them. We now do their fulfillment. We do their sourcing. We do their packaging. Now they're doing about a quarter meal a month. Yeah. Um, and that guy- and he just posted organic content. He didn't even know what, he didn't know how to go into Facebook Ads Manager. He All he did was got the product from China and just make videos about it every single day. On TikTok. On TikTok. That's it. That's he, magic. He didn't even have a startup capital. He was just a kid. And you could do that today. Start that from zero today. I think a lot more people are doing it today than when I was back then. Oh, yeah. Because back then, the notion was you need 20, 30K to start a company. Of course, our stuff was not pretty. We we designed the logo um, on an iPad, just <laughs> drawing it on an Illustrator. And then I just figured out how to use Canva to put it on it. There is no branding. There's no brand guide, no, nothing. Website yeah. was free. If you want to go that route, it's still there. There are still free sites, free themes, Canvas free. And especially with AI, you can create a lot more graphics than what I had back then. Yeah. Um, but my whole thing was just to push back against the notion that for you to be an entrepreneur in e-commerce, you need a lot of money to start. I don't think that's true for all Because industries. up to that point, you had gotten all your traffic and all your sales for, for free. I mean, I guess you had spent some money to acquire the network of blogs. Yeah. But, but like you didn't spend money on ads, you spend money on an asset. Yeah. Uh, I love that. So, so I want to shift gears with our last few minutes here and talk about, I mean, things are going well. It seems like, you know, everything we've talked about up to this point is you're riding high. <laughs> why, why do you think it is that you woke up one day and just decided you didn't really want to wake up and you didn't really want to do it anymore and you didn't really want to? You didn't see the light at the end anymore. I think the goal, the goal is misplaced. Uh, for you to really go through as an entrepreneur, there needs to be a intrinsic fire that is constantly burning high for you to wake up every day to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're we're working the toughest job. Listen, there's a lot more toughest job than what we yeah. do. I'm I'm well aware of the difference between like having a podcast conversation yeah. and, and posting it on YouTube. Look, it's a lot of work, yeah. but it's it's not like putting on a roof in yeah. Las Vegas. There, there's definitely hard jobs in what we go through. Yeah. But it's not just the intensity of the job, but it's also the risk that we take. You know, at any given moment, I wake up worried that I get sued and I have a 100K legal uh, bill. You know, maybe a client wants to sue us for SMS compliance yeah. for whatever. Uh, maybe uh, my shipment is completely delayed and I cannot launch it and I will just miss our revenue target and I can't pay back our our other um, accounts uh, payables. Yeah. Every single day I live with those stuff. So it's not that my job- And then when you start job, building in public, then your reputation's on the line too. Exactly. So it's not that my job is hard. It's just, there's a lot of things weighing down on me that unless your fire is burning high enough, it's very hard to go through that every single day for years. I think one of the hardest things is when you start to be responsible for other people's meals. Oh man. When you've got people working for you who are counting on the company, mm -hmm. And, and their paycheck they get from it to pay mm -hmm. their rent and to buy their dinner and to and and that ultimately ultimately the responsibility falls on you that one's that one's the toughest I actually have never taken a single pay from Dell 
for the five years I've I've run it. Wow. Uh, my entire life is paid for by, you know, my consulting gigs. You know, I do a lot of stuff with Twitter. That pays for my life, pays for my rent, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I've never taken a single cent. I've always paid my employees before me. Um, I've always made sure to give them bonuses at the end of the year, even if when we didn't do that well. I want to make sure that they're incentivized to keep going. Um, and Some people would say that's not wise. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's different styles. There, it, there's different parenting styles. There's different management styles. For yeah. me, I like to just give my employees what I think they should get um, for the work that they put in. Because I also think that the business may not be where I need it to be because of myself. I, I look at that of what are the choices that I made that maybe slow us down. Um, so it's not entirely their fault. They're just one piece of the equation. I'm not right. going to blame it on them just because we're doing pretty poorly. Um, but of course, that takes out of whatever I pay myself. So whatever I would have paid myself, you just give it out to little bonuses, to little trips. As long as you have a, a way of paying for yourself. That's, yeah. But, but I, I mean, some would say the reason people would say that was not wise is because then that is part of the reason why you lose the light at the end of the tunnel. Because mm -hmm. the money represents some level of freedom to you. And if you're never, ever taking the money, then. But let me ask you this. You know, you've kind of decided your management style and that's fine. Uh, you woke up. The fire's not there. And, and honestly, I think you can't explain it. I've gone through this as well. The best way I can describe it is it's, it almost always happens. And I don't mean to sound like douchey about this. It almost always happens when you make some amount of money where you're like, uh, I'm not, it's not like I'm set for life, but I'm set for a minute. Yeah. And why? Like, why do I want to go sit down at my desk just so I can be set for another, another minute? Just so, you know, like what you start to realize you never figured out your why to start with. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's what it was for me. So, I mean, you're, you're here, you're, you're kind of making a comeback here. I want to kind of wrap the show by asking you, like, what was it that helped you figure out, you know, how you wanted to come back and, and why you really want to be doing this? Well, I'm coming back to introduce my packaging manufacturing business. Um, and it's because I, for the first time, felt really passionate about what I do. And that gets me up in the morning. That gets me excited to go to these client meetings. Um, that gets me excited to talk about, about my business. So I'm finally back to share the journey again, kind of like what I did with Doe back in the day. Um, but this time I feel like I'm actually passionate about it. Because Doe was, you know, I didn't wake up and say, I'm going to yeah. start a lash company. Right. Um, but we did make one of the best lashes on the market. We won a lot of wars for it, which is a byproduct of, oh, let's see what I can scrap together and, and create. But I wasn't passionate about it. You know, I don't, Mm -hmm. I, I don't wear lashes. I'm not like, I love this. But in the new business I'm working on, I get to work with a lot of amazing brands, a lot of founders. And I found that that was what I loved. That's why I went into consulting for a little bit um, after my last gig yeah. was that I love working with companies. I love working with founders. It gets my brain working. Yeah, uh, I get to work on a lot of things. It, it scratches the itch. I, you know what? I, I haven't taken a job, a W2 job for years. Yeah. I took this job with Triple Well for that exact reason. Because I'm like, oh, I get to like, work on people with their work, work on problems with people on the problems they're having, like, you know, go back and forth. And that's why I like the format of this type of pod too. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't always do this format, but it's my favorite one because I'm like, I like working through the process of solving problems and seeing how successful people's brains work and, and challenging my brain to work better and, and stuff like that. So. Yeah. That's why I started my pod too. I didn't even yeah. have a sponsor for the podcast. I just want to talk to people. Yeah. It's like 30 minutes to talk to someone who I think is so brilliant in certain, certain categories. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was like free consulting. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jason, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. Um, find me on Twitter at, at E G G R O L. I. It's actually an I at the end. It's an I, not an L at the end. I know. Couldn't get the L. It's a capital I. But Dude, right, after like, Elon took over, they they took that away. You, oh. you can't capitalize it anymore. Yeah. See, I, I was always tricked into thinking it was egg roll because you're using a capital. I couldn't change it. After I got verified, they say if you change it, you'd lose check mark. And this is before people can pay for it. So I was yeah. like, okay, I'm not going to change it. But I'm also on Instagram at Pug, P U G. Dang, I can't believe you got that at PUG. All right, so at Instagram at PUG, uh, at Eggrolli or A E G G R O L I on Twitter. Um, great follow and a great person. And definitely, if you have an ecom brand and you want to up level your unboxing experience, hit up Jason. Uh, follow, subscribe, rate, review, do whatever the thing that people ask you to do wherever you're listening is. And we'll see you next time.